This is the state of the nation. Ibifa Mwanga. We are deliberate, we are reasonable, we are uncensored. The state of the nation with Henry Salva. Welcome to the State of the Nation. My name is Henry Sally, and before we start, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto African Alumni Association for it for over years has been the political land of Kiron Wenden, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across the Kato Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity work in this land. Uh, welcome to the State of the Nation. My name is Henry Sully, and we are delighted to have you uh, join us in this conversation to, uh, today. Uh, in the studio with me, I do have uh, one of our regular uh, panelists, Mr. Uh, Julius uh, Mitala. He will be introducing himself shortly. Uh, and we do have uh, uh, one of Uganda's most distinguished uh, media personalities, uh, Dr. Jimmy Spire Sentongo. Uh, most of you uh, call him the cartoonist. Uh, I, I call him the most influential uh, parody illustrator uh, in, in Uganda, probably East Africa. Uh, uh, this uh, doctor uh, or professor of philosophy has written and published three books in one year. That's a record. In academia, it's very, it's very complicated uh, to be able to write three books and publish them uh, in one year. Uh, so I want to give him kudos uh, for doing that. Uh, among the books he has written this uh, past year uh, include uh, Quarantined, which talks a lot about his experience uh, when he was... Uh, uh, when he was tested, when he was quarantined uh, for having come back to uh, to Uganda, and of course uh, the experiences he went through during the the, the quarantine time, uh, he, he will tell you uh, more about it. He will tell you more about it. Uh, but he has also written uncomfortable laughter. Uh, uncomfortable laughter is another book that, uh, uh, of course. He calls it the uncomfortable laughter because sometimes uh, we tend to laugh at things uh, that under normal circumstances would require some sort of uh, weeping or crying or uh, mourning. Uh, he calls it the uncomfortable laughter because that's where the country is. That's where we are. Uh, we shall be uh, discussing a, a little bit about uh, uh, uncomfortable laughter. Uh, and actually today's topic is specifically on that, the uncomfortable laughter uh, or the bitter laughter. Uh, you, you could call it so many uh, names. It has been, uh, uh, there's a lot that has been written about uh, parody, satire, uh, as political parody, as political uh, parody or criticism uh, or response to certain uh, events that happen within a, a certain country. Uh, but he has also written what I saw when I died. Uh, I, I don't know where this guy gets all the content, but uh, yeah, it, it is it it is uh, it is admirable uh, that he continues uh, to to write and uh, inform us. So hopefully, we 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 do realize that it's a blessing to have uh, such a such a talent. Uh, in the country, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, they are treasuring him as much as he deserves to be treasured uh, as, a, as an educator, as an educator. Uh, he's, he seems to be having trouble joining us. Uh, I'm not sure if he's... He seems to be having trouble joining us, but he will join us shortly. Anyways, uh, I'm really excited to have you guys. Uh, to have you join us, uh, it is 
very humbling to have you once again. I know we have uh, we haven't been around for uh, a couple of weeks now. Uh, I think about two or three weeks. Uh, there are many things that have been happening, uh, and of course, uh, even though we we hate to disappoint you, uh, sometimes there are certain things you have to do because you need me to be sane and uh, self-reflective uh, and uh, informative. Uh, so you want me to come here when I'm ready uh, to have this discussion. Uh, and of course, with each and everyone in the studio. Uh, right now in the studio, I have my brother. Mitala uh, Muzukuru why don't you introduce yourself, sir? Thank you very much, Henry. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, as you've hinted, you know, it's been quite a while since we've been able to congregate, you know, in this space and have these sorts of conversations. I must admit, you know, hands on chest that uh, I've missed being here. But there are certain things that really overtake you and uh, you have to also be able to distribute your time, you know, evenly so that you can also be able to attend to other businesses as well so that you keep, you know, a holy kind of balanced kind of life existence. But uh, it's, it's very nice and uh, greetings to everybody who's watching us, everybody who's following us. By way of introduction, Julius Mitala is my name. I always prefer to go by my screen name, Mitala Muzukuru Wam Swangali. Uh, that holds a lot of uh, you know, significant memories for me in recognition of my grandfather, Omwami George William Nika Muswangali, Salama Rodi. Mwogene Salama Rodi, Wario Zoni, Namba Jiraita Muswangali Zoni. So that is uh, where I hail from. And uh, it's always important for me to make sure that you know, I emphasize that, you know, there are not very many people who have been able to, to you know, to, 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 to have a piece of cake from, from right. our Uganda as it is today. So right, right. I have to celebrate my grandfather for having, for having a piece of cake, you know, from, from our Uganda as it is today. So, Indeed. yeah, what, what do I do? I am a lawyer. My special interest is in mental health law. You know, advocating for the rights of people who have been detained or who have been affected by mental health in one way or another, and making sure that you know we continue to, couch, to, to cultivate that path to make sure that you know people can live lives that are meaningful and people can be supported, you know, in a manner that uh, enables them to live, you know, with their various you know conditions. I live in the UK, and uh, here I am. Let's have this discussion, this conversation about the uncomfortable laughters. It's, it's, it's a very interesting subject, actually. We, do, we all do laugh. I mean, right now I'm laughing. It's very difficult for somebody to know whether I am truly happy, whether I'm, I'm, I'm expressing myself in, in my true happiness, or there are things that are happening behind the scenes that somebody cannot be able to really to, to delve into and understand, you know, the, 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 thick, the thick of it. But it will be nice to hear, you know, how this discussion and conversation will progress. Thank you very much, Henry, and thanks for providing me the opportunity to be here. Back to you, sir. Always a pleasure to have you, my friend. Uh, and uh, with that being said, I wanna take this opportunity to also congratulate you uh, on your most <laughs> recent milestone. Uh, congratulations, my friend, you have become a master of law. Uh, I, I, I think I think now I would like people to start addressing me with my full credentials. <laughs> right, <laughs> it is a must of law. It is yes, a yes, must of yes, law. You know, you know something. Uh, uh, when, when when I was away last week for my graduation, um, the, the vice chancellor of the university was addressing the congregation. It was quite a number of us, and he said that you guys you should wear your achievement proudly, and I wear it with pride. You know, it's a masters of law. You know that means. I am one of the experts in a field uh, that is quite diverse. And, 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 and the area of mental health, actually, you know, people have lots of misconceptions about mental health. So I think it's very important and relevant that you've got people like me uh, who are well established in that, in, 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 that, in that domain and can be able to address things with authority, you know. So, 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 so that is an important aspect. And, 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 I, and I welcome it. And definitely I wear it with pride. Of course, uh, I want to congratulate you again. Uh, I know what it uh, it takes uh, to complete a master's thesis. Uh, a lot of time that you have put in. Uh, I want to give you. Uh, I want to give your family, uh, and especially your wife Kudos, uh, 
uh, for having uh, uh, afforded you to complete uh, a, a, a master's in law. It's uh, it's incredible, uh, and uh, I want to celebrate you. I want to celebrate your family as well. Uh, you know, congratulations, you know, my brother. Some some of these things when we are doing them, we are looking at uh, we are looking at you know we are looking at our families, at our own personal circumstances and personal situations. Um, I would like my children to look up proudly at me and also have something to aspire towards, you know. And I think this is something we think is in the background related to a different subject. But this is important to set those barriers, to set to set those standards so that the people who are coming after you can be able to aspire to something better. I think uh, one of one of the problems of those of us who have been living in the diaspora for a very long period of time, mind you have been yet coming to 20 years now, 18, 18 19 years, that's quite a long time for somebody to be away from your home country. Uh, I did discover earlier on that one of the challenges that we tend to face when we come here is that, you know, you have, the, you have to kind of reconstruct yourself afresh. It's like you've never existed. So you've got to reconstruct your existence in a completely new environment. And therefore, the struggles and challenges that it takes for you to be able to rediscover yourself in a new domain, in a new environment, in a new existence, can take a toil on you in some respects. You know, many of our friends, you know, they concentrate a lot on working. And working is not a problem. All of us have worked. But also, you know, the journey for your own self-improvement is very important because we cannot afford to continue this narrative of Nkubache. You know, when you talk about Nkubache, people tend to look at the Nkubache as the lowest of the lowest. They look at you uh, from the perspective of people who are doing, you know, and I don't want to, I, I don't want, I don't want to sound like I'm disparaging people because I've done all these things in my existence in the last 18, 20 years. There is nothing that I've not done when I've been in this country, you know. But I think you always have to have that drive, the ambition, and I think this is something. This is a message we should constantly be giving people that we interact with that you can do it. The opportunities are there. You just need to focus, find a field that you love find something that you, really, you, you you are really passionate about and pursue it. And, you know, the sky is the limit for you. So that, that's really important. And I thought that I should share that kind of, uh, you know, message with the people who are following us. The sky is the limit. Uh, of course, uh, people need to hear these words because when they don't, when you do not hear something, you cannot envision it. Uh, but once you hear something, you can envision it and you can try to achieve uh, that what you always wanted to. Uh, also remembering that age is just a number, actually. Today is yeah. my birthday, by the way. Today is my birthday. <laughs> yeah, but what, age is just a, a number. What a shame. I, I should be ashamed of myself for not even wishing you a happy birthday. Seriously. <laughs> it's okay, but yeah, age is just a number. You can achieve everything that you want in these countries. Uh, and given the conversation that is uh, transpiring back home, uh, where they seem to not uh, want us as much as we want them, uh, where we uh, at this moment we are re required to to ask for uh, to, to 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 ask for to, to ask for uh, an invitation later to go back to Uganda, even though your name <laughs> is uh, Muzukuruwa Muswangari, you even have your your grand your granddad even has a village named after him, my friend. Now, if you are going to Uganda. Uh, you need an invitation from back home. Uh, so these are all things you are going to talk about. Uh, how do they uh, impact us? What does it mean uh, financially? Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, so what, what does it mean financially? And uh, uh, what do we need to do? What conversations? How do we need to, uh, 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 to engage in this discussion? Uh, Dr. Spire is trying to uh, to to connect. He's still having trouble, uh, which is not surprising given uh, given where we live, uh, given our country's uh, very capable internet infrastructure. Um, <laughs> yeah, so he is trying to to connect. Uh, I'm not sure if he hears me. He doesn't hear me. Uh, 
Oh God. Yeah, he will, he will join us when, when he's able. I've tried to, 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 to let him know what he needs to do. Uh, of course, he has been here before, you know. You, you know that very well. Uh, but I want to thank uh, each and everyone who actually follows this conversation uh, and tries to... Yeah... I think I think what I what I might suggest for Dr. Spire is maybe let him try to reboot completely and come back in. Yes, break. I think yeah, I think he needs to reboot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, we, we really we, we really don't want we really don't want to. We don't, we yeah. Don't want so to yeah, you you need to reboot and come back, uh, so that you can also put the audio. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, I guess what I was saying is that uh, I, I, I want to appreciate all the people who are always uh, following these conversations. These, these are not easy conversations to have. Sometimes they are very dry uh, and heavy. Uh, so for people who always take time to listen to this conversation and try to assess them and analyze them uh, and try to uh, think about the Ugandan context and how uh, people in the diaspora fit in, uh, uh, I want to thank you uh, for having these uh, conversations. Even when you don't comment, uh, I, I, I think it's very important uh, that uh, you are here and you are listening. Uh, and hopefully when you go uh, to your dining tables, you contemplate about the issues we are talking about or we talk about uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I think it's the onus is on to us uh, to talk about the events that are happening in, in our country. Uh, we hope that at some point uh, these insights can influence how leaders behave uh, or how even us people who are just voters, how we interact with our leaders. Uh, there they, they, they are a lot of things that are happening that, uh, uh, that sometimes you sit back and just smile, not because you are extremely happy, but because you are utterly disappointed uh, that the people who are doing these things are not stupid people uh, under normal circumstances, but that they have consented uh, to becoming uh, the, the machines, the tools that are being used to orchestrate uh, either uh, human rights abuses or uh, other very demeaning uh, uh, and uh, often silly things uh, to engage in, uh, and I and, and and like I think when we engage in these conversations, we share from a point of love for our country, love for our people, because most of us uh, still do have uh, people back home. Uh, Uganda, whether I get an invitation or not, will always be my motherland. Uh, and I think every single Ugandan has that attachment to, to, to the country. Uh, so for some leaders to come out and start uh, drafting certain policies that could potentially alienate uh, other people reminiscent uh, of what happened to the indigenous peoples of America uh, and Canada and Australia and uh, uh, um, the other nations that have had First Nations peoples, or uh, we used to call them the aboriginals, uh, which meant they are the originals of this country. Uh, when you start seeing things that are happening in Uganda, where they are trying to make it very difficult uh, for people who are living outside of Uganda to associate with the country, you, you need to start questioning what are the motives uh, of the people that are having these thoughts and are engaging these, in these conversations. These are tough conversations, uh, but I think we need to have these candid discussions uh, in order for us to ensure that we do not completely give up on our country and hopefully at some point it will uh, get better. I, I don't know what your thoughts are, Mr. Muswanga. Um, 
as we, as we continue to wait for Dr. Spire, because uh, I, I think this discussion is really based on the uncomfortable we, we, afters. We, we shall definitely get into Dr. Spires. And as you can see, Henry, I'm, I'm already uncomfortable. My laughter is uncomfortable in itself because the question you are posing is a very serious question, you know, because these are things that are really go to the central epic of who we are, who you are as a person. They are questions of identity, you know. Just like you've said, you know, you have been away from home. I have been away from home. But I've never woken up, even for a single day, and considered myself to be a stranger in Uganda. I've never. It's, it's uh, basically my heart, the, the, the entirety of my living, the entirety of my existence is based on the basic idea, the concept, the recognition, the realization that who I am as an individual, I'm a Ugandan. I don't need a lesson about that. I don't need nobody to remind me that I'm a Ugandan. It's, uh, these, these are interesting times, my friend. They are very interesting times. But I think a, 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 word, a word of advice I would give um, to people who might find themselves, you know, you know and, uh, kind of entrapped in this kind of situation is that, uh, and, we, and, and, and we have to call up the bitter facts, you know. I think uh, it's very difficult for you, as the English say, it's very difficult for you to, to have your cake and keep it. You either have it or you eat it and you don't have it. It cannot be, it cannot be both ways. Right. I think one of the best ways of, you know, coming out of this awkward situation that has been created for lots of people is now to seriously consider, you know, the, the, the aspect of dual nationality, dual citizenship. Lots of countries where we are, they accept dual citizenship. Even our own country, as even Uganda has now, you know, enacted the you know, laws and policies and, you know, regulations around the, aspect, the concept of dual nationality, dual citizenship. I think that's the only way perhaps um, those people who are affected in that kind of scenario might be able you know, to circumvent those, those kind of you know, challenges. From a, from, a very, very, from a very personal you know, perspective, I've already said I've been here for close to 20 years now, and I've always resisted the idea of, of, of giving up my citizenship as a Ugandan. I am here on a, on a residency permit, which allows me to come in and go as I wish. You know, it's unrevocable. I've got it with me. It allows me to do literally everything that you can think that an ordinary person can do in this country. I can have a mortgage. I can study. I can send my children to school. I can travel the globe. I can go anywhere. But on my Ugandan passport, and I've done that consciously, very consciously, actually. It's not by mistake. I've done it very consciously. And I'm not going to say that I was thinking about these sorts of things when I took that decision. But, uh, you know, sometimes you do things in hindsight and you come back and say, okay, maybe this was going to happen. Because it's very painful, you know, for somebody. And some of the people, by the way, who are coming up with this kind of ideas, they are not Ugandans themselves. They are Ugandanship is questionable, you know. So how do you tell other people that they don't belong when you yourself, you don't belong in the first place? So it's a, it's, it's, it's a very kind of funny kind of situation. But uh, I think for me, that's the only way. It's the only way out I can see it. I mean, as long as the law allows the, 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 the concept of dual citizenship and dual nationality, I think I would encourage all Ugandans who feel affected or afflicted in one way or another by these sorts of, you know, city bogus kind of policies that are being driven through. Perhaps it's, it's about time now to consider, you know, that aspect so that you can be able to kind of, uh, you know, protect yourself against uh, all these uncertainties that we see coming, you know, from left, right, and center. That that really will be my only observation on this topic. We can always come back to it in a more substantive manner, but I think uh, for today, that would be my observation of that. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mitala Muzukuru Wam Swangali, and uh, specifically for talking about that, that, that uh, concept of dual citizenship. Uh, I guess when we come back to that question, uh, to, to, to that later, uh, I'll be asking you why now uh, and why do we have to have to, to first get an invitation later to go visit our countries, regardless of whether we are dual citizens uh, or foreign uh, uh, 
members, uh, foreign foreign nationals. For example, Canadians uh, never used to, to, to they, they don't need to ask for an invitation in order to go to Uganda or to Indonesia or to Singapore. Uh, they can just go to the airport and get the visa entry visa right there or even the US. Uh, why does a Ugandan Canadian right now uh, have to first get an invitation to go to Uganda before they can allow him to board a plane uh, at, uh, at any uh, major airport see, in Canada when uh, a, a, a white Canadian can just uh, head to the air, to the airport, go on, uh, uh, take the plane and go to Kampala and, and, and get that uh, that visa at the airport. That's a, that's a conversation we shall engage in later. Uh, but first, let me welcome Dr. Spire. Uh, Sentongo, uh, the, 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 the colonizers call him Jimmy. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm very, I'm, I'm very excited to have him again. Uh, this is a, 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 a guy who has written and published three books uh, in a year. It's crazy. How do you do that? So it, it is a tough. It's a tough feat in, in, in academia to 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 write uh, all those. Uh, Incredibly uh, inf uh, informative uh, content, scholarly content. Uh, so I, I, I want you to tell us how you do it. But before you introduce yourself and tell us how you do all that, uh, Dr. Spire has written uh, Quarantined. He has written Unpublished, uh, The Uncomfortable After or Uncomfortable After. Uh, and I think his last, um, the most, his most recent publication is uh, What I Saw When I Died. Uh, all those three books, one of each, uh, I am going to give out one of each today uh, as an encouragement to all of you out there to actually go on Amazon and buy his books. Uh, if you're in the diaspora, if you're back home, uh, call him, uh, or, uh, reach out to him uh, and buy a book uh, from him. These are very informative books uh, for those of you who are thinking about uh, transforming your country, I think you need to interact uh, with, with his content uh, beyond what you interact with uh, on Facebook. I know he, he writes a lot on Facebook, but uh, uh, have a candid conversation with him uh, through his books. Uh, so if you have time, please uh, go ahead uh, and uh, contact him. But today we are giving out three books, one of each, uh, one of each to any person uh, who will either who will either call to ask him a question or uh, who will either call to ask him a question or write a question in the comments uh, addressing uh, what we, we shall be talking about today. Uh, Dr. Spire, welcome to the State of the Nation. How are you doing? And congratulations on all the, the books you have written recently. Yeah, thank you, Henry. I hope you're able to hear me. Perfect. Yeah, so, sorry, I faced some challenges trying to join. Um, I'm not really familiar with StreamYard. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm more of a Zoom person. So even last time when I was here, I found some challenges. But I'm happy that I finally made it here. Yeah, um, all right. And thanks for the compliments upon the books and the offer to uh, to give them out to some of the, some of the people who are following us. Uh, these are the books, uh, the, mo the latest, what I saw when I died, is that it's, um, it's a 242-page book published by Makerere University Press. It's a basically satirical book. It's a collection of quite a number of my satirical articles. I chose what according to some people are considered to be the best of my satirical work. So it's basically satire and nothing else, uh, with an introduction by Dr. Edgar Nautangi, the head of the Department of Literature, Makere University. And then this is Quarantined, which perhaps you have already seen or read. Uh, it's published by Ubuntu Reading Group. It's a story, a memoir of my experience in quarantine, which I already made a lot of noise about, so many of you must be familiar with it. And then Uncomfortable Laughter, Laughter is a compilation of my 
cartoons not missing the bottle, which many have been asking me about the water bottle. And you can see a character seated there, <laughs> right inside. <laughs> this time, the water bottle is not hovering over someone's head, but someone is seated in it. It's a collection of my cartoons. Um, yeah, it's basically a collection of my cartoons. I have others, but which are academic, so they might not be for this forum, maybe. Uh, decolonization Pathways. Uh, this That's an edited book, eh? Yeah, it's a collected volume. This is 2018. Right. Yeah. Uh, it basically discusses issues around the, um, the coloniality and decolonization of Africa. And this one, Higher Education for Challenges of the 21st Century. This is also 2018. It's also a collected and edited volume. Yeah, besides that, I'm happy to be with you here once again. And uh, Mita, I'm happy to see you again. Every time I see your face, I don't know why I somehow relate it with that of Lumbuye. <laughs> <Apart from, laughs> <laughs> but I think you're not far from each other in certain things. <laughs> this you, are, you, you, are, you, are, you are you are the real troublemaker. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. You I'm are not the real in, troublemaker. <laughs> I'm not in that category. Don't invite trouble for me. <laughs> He's an educator. He's an educator. So. <laughs> now there, yeah. there is a, there is a, there is a why he said that you're a troublemaker. Is uh, at mm -hmm. this point in time, Lumbuye mm -hmm. is, uh, is is uh, is 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 almost uh, is almost a semi god. <laughs> oh, he's semi god. Almost semi god. Yeah. Semi -semi in, in, in the minds, yeah. in the minds of so many different people from so many different places, you know, the mention of the the word Lumbuye sends mm. shivers around people's mm. <laughs> people's bodies so <laughs> yeah inadvertently it's good that they are helping in making him so once <laughs> right. he comes out of wherever he is i think he yeah. will be a much bigger image than he actually I, I i i assume so i assume the same but good to see you dr spire i've been reading uh i've been reading through you know some of your stuff here uh, mm -hmm. came across an article that was written, I think, in 2000, Sunday, March 2021. Yeah, it was written in March 21st, 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, so, laughter is an everyday form of resistance by Spire. Uh, uh -huh. And I think uh, beneath, beneath, beneath that article, uh -huh. it tells us who Spire St. Ongo is, for people who might not know who Spire St. Ongo that if it's about, in about three paragraphs, it lists who Spire St. Ongo is, is an associate dean in charge of research and publication at the School of Postgraduate Studies and Research, Uganda Masters University, uh, uh, goes on to mention so many other credentials about you, and ends by saying that he holds a PhD in Humanistic Studies from the University of Humanistic Studies in Holland. So uh, I, th I think I think the subject we are about to enter about the uncomfortable laughter and for somebody uh, of, of Dr. Spire's you know caliber, stature, and standing, somebody who has studied uh, you know humanities to that to that level, I think, mm -hmm. I think it will be quite an interesting uh, ex your your knowledge and understanding of this subject. But I'll be able to. To pause in my my humble submissions and contributions to make sure that the, the conversation flows very smoothly. Nice to meet you, uh, Mr. Smith. Nice, nice to meet you. Thanks for inviting me once again. Yeah, I I, I think the most important uh, uh, thing about uh, Dr. Spire is that he doesn't just speak to to the intellectuals, the so-called intellectuals. Uh, I, I think uh, he has the ability to speak to everyone, including an average person, uh, either through his uh, uh, illustrations or cartoons uh, or through his writing. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that uh, uh, he has the time to leave academia and come to the media uh, and have that conversation and interact with people uh, through the different uh, mediums. Uh, the Observer, for, for example, or Facebook, uh, and, or any other forms of communication that he uses. Uh, this is a talent that should be celebrated. 
uh, or embraced uh, by a uh, majority of Russian people, Ugandans, uh, especially those who are looking forward to uh, transforming our country uh, into uh, a better Uganda. Of course, uh, many politicians talk about uh, a better Uganda. Uh, many talk about how to uh, change things around. But sometimes I wonder uh, why uh, some of the leaders or politicians haven't embraced uh, uh, Mr. Spire to help them with communicating their messages. Because uh, the, the, the talent that you, you, you expose is incredible uh, and it's relatable. So anyone who, who is serious about transforming the nation should uh, uh, should try to collaborate with you in so many different ways so that uh, you guys can continue uh, elevating our country. But before we, 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 we go into the, the deeper conversation, the, the first very first question, which is very uh, simple in my opinion but very uh, complicated as well do, do you think ugandans have a, an opportunity to laugh uh, mr Museven out of power can we make fun can we make Museven? can we make make Museven? can we make fun of Museven to the extent that he will be shamed out of power yeah. Well, that's a big one. And I would say that my intention in creating laughter, creating humor is not basically to get seven out of power through such means, um, but it's more of uh, a way of coping with uh, many of the things I, uh, that I would say have come with Mr. Seven's reign. You see, laughter is some sort of... Uh, a palliative thing. It's some sort of uh, a painkiller for us. It's strange. I was going to say it as we were beginning that both of you looked very happy, and one would be saying, "Are these Ugandans? Why is it? <laughs> what is it that is even making them laugh at the same yeah. time?" One would expect to see us sad, given everything, all the things that we see every day, that we read in our newspapers, that uh, you hear about if you try to follow news about Uganda. You would expect that Ugandans would be very sad people. But humor, laughter is just a way of coping. You would still ask, why do we even have to cope with this? Because coping would somehow imply that um, you have nothing else to do. Partly this is um, a response out of helplessness. You can fight something, fight and fight until you reach a point and you say, but am I going to be unhappy all my life? Because what you fight starts seeming as if it's uh, invincible, as if it's something you cannot push away. So you, uh, as a way of uh, helping yourself live through it, you say, okay, let me find ways of laughing about it such that as I continue pushing, as I continue engaging it, I will not live in sadness. It's 35 years now and we are still counting. So if we were sad from 1986 and we continue to be sad in 2021 and maybe beyond 2021, I think it, would, it wouldn't even be healthy in the first place. When you look at Uganda's social media, maybe we are some of the people that produce the, if I can count it in terms of amount, we produce the greatest amount of humor of jokes in Africa or in the world. Why are we so much into jokes even about things that are painful? We joke about our president refusing to leave power for all those years. We joke about the lies he has made, how he has been changing positions. We joke about ministers uh, stealing. We joke about poor services. We joke about um, uh, even death. We joke about COVID. We, jo we joke literally about everything. It's not that we are insensitive. It's not that we have become... Uh, uh, what word could I use? We have become uh, hardened where we have reached immune. a point where yeah. maybe even immune to pain that we have reached a point where we can no longer feel it. 
we feel it, but we still have to live through it. And because we don't know when it's going to end, and by the way, although this is not uh, a statement we might not want to hear, there are people who have literally given up. There are people who have um, somehow decided as some sort of a cynic opposition that if you cannot beat these people, let you just either let them do whatever they can do or join them and eat. It doesn't mean that by joining them to eat, you're celebrating, you're happy about what they are doing, but out of helplessness, you're saying, well, I'm not going to lose all. So it's all these categories of people that are resorting to some sort of, uh, um, I call it some sort of a dance in the graveyard that we look like witches when we are dancing, when we are happy about the things that happen around us. But I don't think many Ugandans would be alive now if we were sad, if we were lamenting about everything that happens. Uh, just uh, today, uh, I did not have power. We didn't have power the whole day from yesterday. And even after calling, informing Umeme, it took, uh, it took two days, and I think those are a few days if you compare with stories of other people. It took two days for them to come to care, to repair something from which they are act actually earning. So if I was to be mad about such things, I don't know <laughs> how my life would have been. Sometimes uh, I listen to my brothers and sisters who come from the diaspora, maybe especially those who have spent so many years there. They come here the first years, I think they are years of landing, the first months, they are years of landing here. They are complaining about everything, complaining about blackouts, complaining about water that is on and off, complaining about the roads. But soon I think they realize that <laughs> this is life. It's normal here. So if you don't accept, you're going to die. <laughs> and slowly you see them adjusting you see even when uh, they get to a pothole they will not say anything they just drive around it <laughs> it doesn't mean they've actually considered that this is right but how do we continue living in this mess uh, there is um, an article here that i wrote some time back i think about five years ago in this book what i saw when I died, uh, the title is We Need More Alcohol and Jokes. Yeah. That if there is anything we need so badly in Uganda, it's more alcohol and more jokes. Why alcohol and not services? This alcohol is meant to help us to bear what we are going through. In a drunken state, it can start looking normal because every time you, you're sober, you're reminded about the so many things that are wrong. And I'm not trying to normalize this. It's a way of making fun about it, but fun that is supposed to bring the torch to what I, I right. think is otherwise unacceptable. So are we going to joke on seven out of power? Um, apart from coping, you remain with this nagging feeling that maybe their consciences are not really, not completely dead that at a certain point they will feel so silly after all the jokes that are made about them and what they do. And maybe they'll get to their senses and correct certain things. If serious talk cannot work, that they don't seem to be listening to any serious talk that is uh, addressed in all the garments of civility, all the garments of uh, formality, maybe put on this garment of making everything look stupid, everything look funny, everything look drunken, perhaps then they could be awakened. So in this uh, article I met that I mentioned, I write towards the end. Uh, I don't. I hope I have the time to read this small part out. Yes, you, you, you do have the time to read, of course. Okay, just a small, the last part of the article. As I gallop my vodka, I, sc I scroll through Facebook posts and WhatsApp messages. So much humor making rounds. I have this Nigerian friend working with the University of Ibadan. He never runs out of jokes. One time I asked him why most Nigerians I have met are funny. 
The answer was a funny one too. He said, you see, life in Nigeria is crazy. With all the things that we see, hear and go through, we have to find something to laugh about to make life bearable. What he said makes sense now, and Ugandans have already learned this coping mechanism. We need more jokes about anything, including these horrible accidents on Massacre Road. If we don't laugh about these things, their weight will kill us. The German philosopher Nietzsche told us that deep inside every adult, there is a child who wants to play. But also, deep inside every desperate person, there is someone yearning for something to smile or laugh about. So we shall also send more comedians to parliament for comical relief to help us bear the painful decisions that sometimes come from people that we must continue calling honorable, no matter how honorless and spineless they are. While these thoughts were running in my mind, as I was driving home, a commuter taxi made a, a sudden U-turn only to ram into a border border that was negotiating a massive pothole in the middle of the road. I pushed my head out of the window to say something, but the taxi driver talked me down faster. Sirika Mwagwe, meaning shut up you dog. Oh God, I need another drink. So this basically just sums up <laughs> the reason why we need to drink more and to laugh more. But it's not that we expect that to uh, push the man out of power. Right, right. Yeah. The reason yeah. why I, 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 mm. I brought it in that aspect is because mm. uh, you referenced, of course, Nietzsche. Uh, but mm. uh, uh, when we go back to Plato, Plato in some mm. of his dialogues uh, mm -hmm. used uh, political parody uh, mm. uh, uh, as a tool of persuasion. Uh, Mm. So they also talk about it in uh, in, in in psychology. I think uh, uh, mm. Fra Fra Francesca De Rico and uh, Isabella Poggi uh, mm. talked about it in in one of their papers called "The Bitter Laughter," uh, mm. where they used parody uh, mm. as, as as a moral uh, and effective priming for political persuasion. Uh, mm. Try and convince people that. Uh, otherwise mighty or seem other uh, seem mighty uh, stronger mm. uh, and you, you you feel like you are completely helpless you can't do anything anymore uh, mm. you try as you said to make fun of the guy so much mm. so that they feel completely worthless and uh, mm. unneeded mm. anymore and they just walk away mm. they just tell us you know what you Ugandans are mm. not serious <laughs> I'm done I'm, I'm gone mm. uh, and he goes with the entire uh, NRM <laughs> government but uh, uh, unfortunately course, often they will join you and laugh as if they don't notice anything wrong <laughs> Exactly. As if they don't, notice, they, uh, of course, uh, as if they don't, they don't uh, notice anything uh, wrong. I wonder what uh, Mr. Mitala thinks about uh, uh, what you have just presented. Uh, but before Mitala comes, I want to remind uh, everyone who is watching us that uh, we do have three offers: uh, one book for each of what uh, uh, Doctor Spire has published this year. You either choose "Quarantined," "Uncomfortable Laughter." Oh, what I saw when I died. Uh, but you first and foremost have to uh, comment with a question to him uh, if you want to, to get into the draw to win a book. Uh, Julius. I fundamentally agree with the observations that uh, uh, Spire has put up. Um, I think for me, my characterization is going to be a little bit different. And, and I think for me, what I get out of... Uh, this continuous lack of seriousness, you know, the, the, the laughing about matters that, you know, on the surface they look like they're unserious issues, but they are very, very serious issues under, mm -hmm. and, and underlying that, that kind of laughter. I think for me, the characterization is uh, you, you are seeing a nation's soul that is sick. We are dealing with, a, with, mm -hmm. with an illness. We, we have, the nation of the soul is sick. That's that's all I I, I, I I can put it, and I, and I think this manifests itself in quite a number of ways. This is why you see bitterness, you see the scale of murders, the scale of lack of empathy and kindness towards other people, 
you know, uh, the jealousies, you know, uh, depression, uh, dependency on substances, drugs, alcohol, etc., and all that kind of stuff. And in the end, that trickles down to issues of, uh, you know, governance, the governance structures, until it took, trickles down into our very core of the, co the, the constitutionalism of our, of, of our government. Because you've got a whole system that is broken, you know, that people are in this situation where you don't know really where to turn to, you know. Say, suppose you're being harassed and you, you go to the police and you know what's going to happen with the police. The police is possibly going to connive with the people who are harassing you and so on and so forth, you know. So I think for me, the characterization I see here is, uh, is, a, is, is a nation that is just really sick. Uh, we could say that we need prayers to come out of that. Or we could, we, could, we could answer the question that you are posing here that, you know, can the nation possibly rely on, 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 on ridicule? ridiculing the system you know the establishment as a mechanism of driving them out of power you know uh it's 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 a it's a it's a complex kind of question without you know straight yes yes yeses and no's because yeah. obviously one of the my, my my the other way i could pose this question is that what is the role of satire what is the role of parody what is the role of political satire really in, 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 in a political dispensation. That's, possibly that's how I could put it. And I think, uh, you know, there, there, there are some benefits that, uh, that, that are true to, to, to that kind of un uncomfortable laughter. Number one, you know, the people who consume that kind of uh, media, that kind of publication, that kind of uh, journalism, they tend to be a lot more engaged than what you would possibly get from mainstream media. Because through parody, through satire, you know, the author tends to, 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 to incite certain feelings that would not normally be easily incitable and when somebody is just reading a plain text. Say if you look mm -hmm. at a cartoon, I, I always see lots of cartoons here, you know, lampooning the British Prime Minister, you know, trying to paint him as somebody who is uh, unserious, somebody who is possibly unstable. You know, he's been having a challenge here with one of his former advisors, a man who was very central in actually, you know, bringing him into government and they had a fallout. And if you look at the sorts of cartoons that have come up, you know, in the media, in the Times, newspaper, you know, it, 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 it generates that kind of laughter. But on the other hand, it also it generates that contempt towards, you know, the people who are apparently in charge of the system that's broken, you know? And I think this is what, uh, this is what Spire is saying here, which I tend to agree with, that maybe, you know, by engaging in that kind of mockery, you know, by engaging in that kind of mockery, maybe somebody hopes that you can get people to seriously begin to think about issues in a far more serious way than what they take they, they, they tend to be you know, they, they take to be under, under normal circumstances I, I i saw i saw i had a clip here right? i saw a video clip where the former justice of the supreme court you know uh the right honorable kanye hamba i think he, mm -hmm. he apparently he's been somebody owes him money a senior government minister owes him money for a long mm -hmm. time for work that he did for him you know several years ago and he has not been paid a penny <clears throat> so he was forced to get into his car drive to the minister's office to try and you know get what he he he, he, he honestly believes he's entitled to and then the other gentleman was on the phone you know it just uh it kind of makes you sick you wonder really when do we as a people become serious when there are some serious issues at play you know because you're looking at here at a man who is a very respectable gentleman a supreme court judge former supreme court judge he's forced you know to take that uncomfortable journey to go to a government minister to request for payment for a service that he says he has rendered and the best that the minister can respond to is by you know kind of uh, belittling him and saying, oh, the man is sick. Don't you see the man is sick? So, so it's, 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 it's that kind of joke that, uh, 
you know, makes a lot of people, you know, very anxious, you know, for lack of words, I think. I, but, but, but as I said, well, yeah, I think what the, my characterization is uh, you are seeing the, you're seeing a sick nation and how we come out of there is really a matter for discussion maybe for another time. I think I, I just have to add that, uh, um, you know, the, 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 obviously satire can be used in very different ways. Uh, it can be used as uh, literally for generating of laughter. Uh, it can also be used as, uh, as a mechanism of, uh, you know, subversive political activity. It depends on how you want to look at it. And this is why in some countries, in some governments become very anxious. They become very uncomfortable, you know, with, uh, with cartoonists because they, because they believe that the, the cartoonist brings out the, 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 the actual feelings of the masses. So that, so, so that in some ways what satire actually tends to do is, the, is, to, is to generate political, mass political participation. You know, I think that's one of the that, that's one of the that's one of the energies that kind of uh, you know literature is, is is capable of generating from from the masses. Right. But, on the hand, but on the other hand, there, there there is a downside to that because you know if we if if we take everything so literally to be a joke, you know, I think it breeds what I would call apathy. It breeds mm. some kind of. Uh, it, it, breed, it, it, breed, it breeds a cynical society where people just begin to look at everything like, you know, it, this is a joke and they laugh it off and, you know, life continues. And, and, in, and in the end, you know, things can only get worse and worse and worse because there is that lack of accountability because everybody doesn't think that, you know, the pertaining situation is as serious as it should be. So, so for me, that, that is really my analysis from, from the <laughs> Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, of course, uh, 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 Dr. Spire talked about using satire as a, a healing mechanism uh, to take us away uh, from mm. things that hurt us a lot. But mm. he also uh, realized uh, that lately, even people who have been doing that, people like uh, the Bizonto, for example, uh, mm. they, they, they have been thrown to, to, to jail a couple of times and their, mm. their, their, their livelihood is literally being threatened uh, by, by, by the system within which they serve or they work. Uh, how do you navigate uh, those dynamics? Mm. And like, how do you answer the questions between uh, being able to put the, the message across, but also ensuring that you think about life the the, the hope's way where whereby self-preservation is important mm -hmm. uh, for you to, to, to survive and uh, mm -hmm. be able to actually be free express yourself more freer in, in mm -hmm. an in an in a regime that comes later uh, that will probably mm -hmm. provide a better environment uh, for having mm -hmm. these kinds of discussion mm -hmm. Okay, is that for me? Yes. Okay, um, then maybe before I get to answering that, uh, there is something I forgot to mention. I think one of the most popular books in the world is um, Animal Farm. Mm. Animal Farm is a satirical piece, and I relate this to what uh, Mitala has just talked about. Animal Farm is a satirical piece talking about, uh, I, I guess many people, many Ugandans, if you ask them, they don't know. Right. They know Animal Farm, but they don't know what the writer was <laughs> trying to address, which is sometimes one of the dangers of satirical writing, the dangers of uh, uh, speaking through humor, through jokes, that people might take the joke and take it simply to be a joke. Many mm. think that this was basically a fable. The story of animals, um, animals with uh, pigs, uh, yeah. uh, control, eventually controlling others, being uh, uh, shrewd and all that. Yet it was basically trying to show the ironies around socialism uh, and the socialist leaders, the communist leaders, what they were becoming, uh, uh, they shifts from one position to another. But on the other hand, 
looking at how Animal Farm became very popular, it also shows you the power of satire, mm -hmm. the power of using a language that you know many people would want to associate with, many people would want to relate with. That if Animal Farm had been written as a direct book, I guess of very few people would have read it because there were so many books written around that time uh, critiquing socialism, communism, but that might not have gotten the same audience as Animal Farm. Now, coming more directly to the question that you have asked, how we negotiate this space, the Bizondo are getting uh, arrested. Yeah, indeed, space for free expression is diminishing in Uganda. Um, sometimes I've mentioned that there is relative freedom of expression compared to some countries. Unfortunately, when I have to talk about that, I have to compare ourselves to the worst. In terms of freedom of expression, I have to compare ourselves with Rwanda or compare with uh, uh, Zimbabwe. So comparing to Zimbabwe and Rwanda, we are doing much better. Cartoonists can say that, well, we have never been arrested for what we have uh, been doing, the lampooning of the president and many other powerful people uh, for, the, for all the ridicule. And in fact, it's one of the commonest questions I'm asked. Hasn't anyone ever called you, ever invited you to explain or threaten you about the cartoons, about the uh, satirical articles you write? And my answer is no. And then the response you get from some is a plain, wow, Uganda is very free. <laughs> Uganda. Uh, yes, uh, Uganda is very democratic. And I think this is one of the ways in which uh, um, Seven's government plays in a very clever way to give a semblance of democracy where it's not. They know where to touch and where not to touch at certain times. So a person who just goes with what is seen on the surface, maybe a visitor, they'll think that, oh, here there is freedom, there is democracy. Not knowing that in prisons there are many others who are locked up maybe for associating with a certain candidate for having been on a campaign trade of maybe Bobby Wine, I don't think that should be looked at in isolation. That when so many others are rounded up and thrown in jail without any uh, case, any sensible case or taken through the uh, standard constitutional procedures, that we close an eye to that and we only look at a cartoonist who is able to draw and not touch. Maybe this cartoonist is not touched deliberately so that we leave that as a gesture to show that, look, <laughs> there is... We are doing uh, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, we are doing okay. So I do not want to, uh, to project this as a sign that everything is well. That's why every time I mention it, I have to add a disclaimer to it. I have to add a footnote to it that maybe there is some other reason why it's like that. So how, seeing that it's uh, the space is shrinking, that even some surgeries are being arrested. Um, yeah, you mentioned Vizonto, but even Stella Nyans, who some quite often uses uh, Sata, she has been arrested for it. Others reading it directly, but um, the first thing I would note about this, uh, before going more directly to how we negotiate that, but it's also related. When you see that p people are no longer talking directly about something, it's usually a sign that there is something wrong. It's usually a sign that the environment is polluted, that mm -hmm. there is uh, maybe some... Uh, imbalance in power distribution in that setting that the victim or whoever is not comfortable cannot freely talk about what they are going through. You could just look at the setting of a home where you see that the wife or girlfriend, whatever you may call it, is always speaking through songs. They cannot directly talk to the husband, but they just move around singing, ah, Siri Muyembe, and you're going to be Okay, why can't, why can't this person speak their mind directly? Okay. But what I want is for you to take me for introduction, to come to uh, my home to be introduced to my parents. But singing, right. or then others, maybe even a man. I don't want to say that only um, 
wives will be unfree to say that. If you hear a man singing, hey, <laughs> this man cannot say that directly. It shows something. So when you hear many Ugandans talking in tongues, many Ugandans resorting to the language like that of Bizonto, they are talking about tribalism or tribal imbalances, ethnic imbalances, regional disparities. <laughs> But they have to start by saying, okay, um, Akulida Polisi, so and so, and he's from Northern Uganda. The one who, uh, the Chief Justice is from uh, uh, Kasese. Why can't these things be talked about directly? Of late, we know that in Uganda, um, while we have an offense called uh, sectarianism, something like that spread, uh, making sectarian statements, uh, which I think uh, is basically about uh, religious intolerance or spreading uh, religious propaganda or things that are potentially harmful around religious identities and ethnic identities, which are, happen to be among the most sensitive in Uganda. So while we have that law, which I think is in good faith and is um, is a good a good law to have in a society like ours. Currently, it's being abused. The offense is to talk about uh, ethnic imbalances. When you talk about ethnic imbalances, that is sectarianism. They'll use the same law <laughs> to charge you for pointing out that look here and here. I think there is an imbalance. So I know you're trying to incite people against uh, a certain group of others. And that's why people will resort to using such a language. Where ordinarily we would, um, where I would expect that if I spoke to the president about this, he will listen. If I spoke to the first lady about this, she will listen. But I know that instead she's going to pull out a hammer. I'll find other means of communicating the same thing. But these means are partly meant to, uh, to protect for our own protection. And this is where I get more directly to your answer. How do we navigate the reducing, the diminishing space for freedom of expression? When I draw a cartoon, quite often I don't label my cartoons. I will not draw a cartoon of, uh, let's say, minister, and I label it so and so, a cartoon of the inspector general of police, and I indicate their name there. So if they came uh, to maybe accuse me of doing something of, uh, um, of whatever they can accuse me about, I will simply say it's not you. You just happen to look the same, and maybe you're the one to prove to me that it's you in the cartoon. But otherwise, I find a way of uh, dodging the hurdles that I know I might very easily face in a, a space that is not really free. So that's one of the strategies. But I wouldn't say that it's completely safe. And maybe that is the reason why they have not come for me or any other person using that kind of language. I know when they cannot get you by using the law, then they'll use arbitrary means. Or they'll create other trumped up charges <laughs> against you, and maybe to do with the taxes or whatever. When uh, they failed with the case of Stella Nyanz, I think eventually they got something else <laughs> to uh, to accuse her of. So it's just an attempt that, well, we are not going to keep quiet completely. At least let's speak in tongues, let's speak in directly. If that also fails, maybe ultimately we'll go quiet. But when people go quiet, as uh, Mitala said, that is very dangerous. When you see someone is suffering but quiet, not saying anything, just know that at a certain point there will be an explosion you cannot hold it inside for so long. And even in the humor that we are using currently, the way we are laughing, we are laughing about a disease that is growing and at a certain point will explode. In that article you mentioned, I talk about uh, a common event, something we see quite often at funerals. Someone is in pain, they've lost a very close person, a, uh, maybe a, a, a child, a wife, a husband, but you see them laughing all through the funeral. What does that make you think? 
not necessarily that this person did not care about the deceased, but this person, first of all, could be in denial. Second, they are overwhelmed. They don't even know how to respond. They don't know how to react. They've not yet accepted. But even if that happens all through the funeral, through the mourning period, maybe two, three days, you're able to laugh. At a certain point, <laughs> you will break down. For uh, some people, it happens a month after, a year after, you find them mourning continuously for a death that happened so many uh, days ago. It means that they've not found space for releasing what is inside. So when Ugandans speak directly, you purge them. They speak by other means. You block that as well. They run to social media to make their noise from there. You turn off Facebook. Uh, you load uh, taxes onto the internet, but basically for silencing people. Ultimately, they look for other means of releasing that pressure. And maybe many of us do not want to go there, but it might become inevitable at a certain point. Yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> Mr. 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 as a legal mind on this panel, uh, what are your thoughts on, the, on uh, Dr. Spire's submission? I, I am strongly of the view that, uh, you know, cartoonists, journalists, and whoever be it, it is really at liberty, you know, to critique public officials, people who, who hold public office. It's part and parcel of the game. It's part and parcel of the exchange of that concept of uh, a social contract that you watch by, you watch by, you know, a public office, as, 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 as somebody who is entrusted in that office to perform certain duties and functions, not for yourself, but on behalf of a group of people. And therefore the people for whom you are entrusted that authority or power or whatever, are within their rights, you know, to ask for questions, you know, especially questions when they perceive that things are not going in the right direction. So I think, I think, uh, that, that is really the gist of the matter and Spire, you know, does actually do, you know, mention it quite in very clear terms that this issue of uh, the narrowing space within, you know, people can have, you know, honest and, 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 and simple discussions about things that afflict them, about how they, they, about how they feel they should be governed. The space does not seem to be existed any longer. I think for me, when you look at uh, you know our, our society as Ugandans, I think we are what I describe to be a superficially happy or superficially laughing society. People project this uh, this happiness. People project you know they flaunt things. You know they, they people want somebody wants to drive a nice car not because they actually need that car but because they want to show somebody else that hey look here i've also arrived i've done it you know so i think i think i think that is that is an illness in itself and i think it's affecting uh, it's affecting our ability to interact with each other you know with honesty and sincerity because what and un what lies underneath that kind of uh, you know superficial laughter is bitterness and this is what I described earlier on that, you know, when you look at our society, things like depression, things like bitterness, jealousy, murders, unexplained thuggery, you know, the, even the way the authority handle themselves, it's, it, it's a society of thugs, you know, and the people who are really at the receiving end of those kind of ex excesses, you know, they, they, they really have no choice, you know, but to put on, you know, an artificial kind of, uh, you know, acceptance as if they, they accept what's going on, but deep within people's minds and hearts, they are very uncomfortable with what they are seeing. I think uh, you also have a problem of uh, a leadership that is not sincere with the public. You know, very often the president says things that he himself, actually, I don't believe he believes in them. You know, we've had so many instances. I mean, the very latest example i think in less than a month ago the president was on national tv and he was giving instructions to all his uh you know armed forces how they should respect people's human rights and so on and so forth but actually he went to the extent of saying that you know a soldier should not even be backing at a citizen you know 
But uh, less than two days ago, you saw what happened to the right honorable Sewanyana, you know? Mm -hmm. A man who has been arraigned before court. The court has pronounced itself on something that is uh, very crucial, uh, which goes actually to the core of our constitutional governance, you know, the issue of bail. And the president seems to be very uncomfortable with that. And nobody seems to be, you know, able to have a straight face to say to the president that, Mr. President, I think that that approach is wrong. Even people who are around him, you know, you look at, you look at institutions like the education ministry, there is trouble in the education ministry. I've been listening to a clip here where the right honorable, you know, Babu has been uh, expressing a lot of anger and dissatisfaction about what's going on in the Ministry of Education. And he's very categorically clear stating that, you know, you know, this ministry has been mismanaged. But I mean, hey, look, ask the question, who is at the helm? Who is the head of the Ministry of Education? It's the, it's the first lady, you know? And do you honestly think, or do you honestly believe or contemplate that somebody in their sober mind would go to the, to, to the first lady in her capacity as Minister of Education and challenge her, you know, on something uh, maybe on policy, or maybe on, on something in challenge on, on principle. I, I, I look at Mr. Muingo, I've always admired Mr. Muingo as an educator, you know, when we were in school, these are the different heads of schools that we used to admire and look up to, you know, to be in the presence of Mr. Muingo at that time was like being in the presence of, uh, you know, a, a very supreme kind of authority. And uh, I, I see him you know, prevailing over a situation which clearly he seems to be uncomfortable with. Because as an educator, you cannot see the kind of mess that's going on within the Ugandan education sector. And a man of this proficiency and experience as an educator, as somebody who has set up educational institutions and so many people have passed through in sons to be very successful young men and women, I don't think that he's very comfortable and happy with himself. So it's very easy to see Mr. Muingo, you know, engaging in what we call, what we're discussing here, you know, the, the uncomfortable laughter, you know. But, 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 but it's because we lack that sincerity as Ugandans to be able that, you know, we can have an exchange whereby we can disagree on things in principle without attempting, without swearing to cut out, you know, the, the, the eye or cut off the mouth or nose of the person that we disagree with. So I think, I think that, 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 that's, that's really where we are. So uh, that insincerity of, uh, of our leadership, you know, that culture of total fear that has been, you know, inculcated into, into our people, you know, uh, you, you can name it, you can call it whatever you can call it. But for me, and I want to go back to what I've already said, that I think for me the characterization here is a sick nation. And we need to find a way of rehabilitating the soul of the nation so that we can be able to align ourselves to, you know, uh, a, a normal kind of approach. I think the danger is that, uh, and I think Spire has already again hinted on it, the danger is that well, the, the, the problem here seems to be that the leadership seems to be hell-bent on portraying, you know, some kind of normalcy, you know, some kind of normal kind of situation we have a hybrid kind of situation where we have you know a constitution or semi or diluted constitutional arrangement <laughs> against a typical military you know kind of establishment and i think uh, it's possible that there are lots of people who are sensing that things are not going in the right way but as spire just right to the states it's just too dangerous for you to state your mind categorically on those sorts of things. I've been listening to Honorable Nadui, Mr. Nadui, who was uh, as a former former bush fighter, has been in office, has been chairman of uh, a district. He has been uh, one of the central figures in the, in, 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 the, in the movement, you know, in the movement government. And uh, I've been listening to his conversations recently, and. He, I must, I'm, I'm, sometimes I listen to him and I say to myself, you know, how come that when Mr. Naduli was still, still had the audience of the president, he was not able to say these sorts of things that he's saying now? Because honestly, when you do listen to him and the sort of things that he's saying, I really wonder if really Mr. Museveni is a sincere person, that people 
that who have been so close to him in the struggle for the last 40 or so many years can speak to him at least candidly like that you know on a man-to-man -man basis and say to him that he's the president i think something is not right here what can we do can we adapt a different kind of approach but uh it's taken them to be out of office and maybe they they are not you know they are not they, they are not in in, the, in, the, in, the, in those comfortable positions where they have been before and i think again that's the problem of uh you know the, the our society and I'm, just to re-emphasize that how unsincere how hypocritical our society can be that somebody is not able to say it to your face when something is wrong but they will go around the back and some you know just gossip without you know uh, engaging in, in, in the conversation that might be helpful and you know uh, uh productive for the national for the for the for a, for a national conversation so i i think those are those are the kind of the challenges but to say that we need prayers is not enough. But uh, because of the prayers alone is not going to take us out of trouble. You, have God, right. you know, you know, you, you know, you know, God, God is not a very fast, responsive person. Sometimes he takes mm. days to respond. So, so, we can, in time. so we can be calling God for another 40 or 50 years before God. You, you remember <laughs> the, the story of the Bible, you know, when, 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 when the Israelites, you know, were suffering in the, you know, in the deserts, and Moses had to come and take them out of the wilderness. And how many years did it take for God to respond to the plight <laughs> of the Israelites? You know, yeah, so we, that, that 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 also depends on whether God is uh, is is indeed alive. So, uh, but, so, uh, but 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 uh, uh, I think I want us to uh, proceed. Uh, but as we proceed, I want to talk about the education because you brought up education and. Uh, as far as I'm uh, concerned, uh, education in Uganda uh, is kind of on a standstill uh, at the moment, uh, except for the higher education uh, and for specifically those who can afford internet, uh, stable internet uh, students, whether they're in Makerele or any other university or college uh, that are able to access online education. Uh, otherwise, most students are uh, seated at home, either accessing tutors or coaches, uh, but are waiting for uh, 2022 January to head back to school. Uh, and if you are if you are studying in a private school, your private school, uh, the, the private school you used to go to, has to first and foremost go back uh, to the fountain of honor uh, to to ask uh, for reinstatement. Uh, as a private school, uh, that's according to what I've seen for uh, so so far in the media that all private schools are supposed to to go back and reapply uh, to be reinstated as private schools. We don't know what the motive for that is, uh, but hopefully every single school that used to operate can still operate. Uh, let, let, let's see. Let, let's see a little parody about. I'm going to share a, a little video that, that speaks to parody as we we are discussing it. Uh, right now, but this time an education parody, I guess. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are after it has been played. Hey. Mama Gina, Jeban. Ata niya kaba niya kabo yu gwen pulida. O vaku gina omukubi. Ato mukubi dechi. Eh, omuaka mulemye. A gude omuaka. Chichi ni gokubo mwana, o mwana gokubo, o mwana gokubo. Echi njagala agwenga, gokubo, anga na gobitegeira. Kakati gobitegeira, obo kubo bukubi. Chibuzo chechi mkubia. Hey. Kiri ya sukari ni omuchele chechi singo kuzitowa. Gobi manyi, gobi manyi kiri omuchele ni ya sukari chechi singo kuzitowa kuchina acho. Gobi manyi, chechi singo kuzitowa. E hey, omuchele. Eh hey, mchere. Eh. Hey, eh hey, mbadendo za tochimanyi. Eh hey, mbadendo za kubabu kubi nji tochimanyi. Eh hey, yo mchere uli mutufu. Hey. Katiko kagambe katia. Mbubiona chechimu kire sigala kilo. Kasiru kongere mu. Kongere mu kubuga ufetu za alaba siru. Kongere mu. <laughs> so I wonder what your thoughts are, as, especially as we talk about education. You know, I'm, I'm an educationist, so uh, when I see these uh, kinds of uh, 
uh, satires, uh, they make me wonder what, 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 what we are breeding, the education system we are breeding. Of course, uh, uh, that was humorous, uh, but it, I, I think it also speaks to how unserious we take education in, in, in Uganda. In this instance, of course, the child was right, uh, the parents weren't right. Uh, but do you see this happening in reality in uh, in, in Uganda, uh, Dr. Spire? Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to respond to that. Yeah, but I know it really happens. I wouldn't, uh, in this case, if what I was to take it as something real, I wouldn't blame the parent. Um, well, of course, what the parent does is uh, wrong to punish a child for <laughs> something. They also have no idea about it. But the reason I wouldn't blame the parent is that we know many of our parents for reasons that you might not even blame them for, are uh, either illiterate or semi-literate. And today there is a practice in many of our schools, especially in uh, urban areas, most of our urban schools, that they are given a lot of homework the idea is that parents should take part, they should participate in their children's education, which is a good thing. But as they emphasize that, they forget the other side that some parents are not really, they didn't go find school. So even if they might want, they cannot meaningfully participate in their children's education. And I, I'm using the word education carefully here. I'm not trying to say that education is only what happens at school or what is on the, on the syllabus. Uh, parents can educate their children in other ways. But if we are looking at what is on the syllabus, the work, the homework that is uh, given to these uh, um, children, and we expect that every parent must participate, I think we are making a mistake. We are trying to do something that is good, but based on wrong assumptions. Sometimes I also look at the work given to my daughters and <laughs> I don't want them to ask many questions because I have no idea about some of the things that they are taught. And some things I disagree, some of the things they are told, who is the head of the family? And they want me to give an answer. Who is the head of the family? Of course, I know that in the scheme of the teacher, there is an answer, the head of the family is the father. I don't want to teach my girls <laughs> the same. I would want to look at it differently. But do I have that freedom, even if uh, uh, I had an answer? Now, that's on the side of maybe just having a different opinion. But how about on the side of the person who has no idea? You're asking uh, uh, when was the Buganda Agreement signed? And the parent, you're asking your father, first of all, you make these parents feel small before their children. You're humiliating them. For a child to bring me a paper with 20 questions and I can't even answer one, naturally I might either get irritated, I respond with anger as a way of pushing this child away, or I'll give them wrong answers if I can gamble myself through it. <laughs> it happens to so many children. In my neighborhood, I have parents who end up sending their children to my home to help them with homework just because the parents do not have any clue. Now, relating that to something uh, uh, bigger, why is our education system like this? Why does this happen? Why are we overloading our children with homework and no one seems uh, to care? Leave alone the fact that this homework uh, that we are asking parents to assist with, the parents might not be able to assist, but even the load of homework itself on Fridays, if the schools were open, on Fridays, children will come with work that is meant to cover the whole weekend. From Monday to Friday, they come back with work that they are supposed to do when they are at home, which means that a child basically has no time uh, for anything else for, to learn about other things. Ch uh, they don't have time to play. They don't have time for uh, participating or uh, doing, uh, helping their parents with uh, home chores. So what kind of education system are, are we constructing? Uh, and why are, are we, have we left it to be like that for all this long? Partly going back to what uh, Mitala said, 
everyone has said, or most people have said, others do not realize that it would be wrong to make the first lady a minister, regardless of the ministry. I wouldn't go into these things of uh, those who are saying maybe she's not qualified as to be a minister of education. I'm not even looking at that. I don't think she should be a minister of anything. I don't think she should hold any government position that requires accountability. Maybe she should only run that office of first lady uh, for which maybe she doesn't really have direct accountability to the public uh, where she can run charity things, uh, run NGOs like uh, uh, this one which she used to run, what is it called? UNESCO. Mm -hmm, there was UNESCO? another. Mm -hmm. Which one? Uh, Uganda, is it Uganda Women's Effort to Save Orphans, USO? USO. Yeah. Uh, USO, there is a time when it was very active and it was doing a lot of work, in my opinion. So if she can run things like that, that would be fine. I'm not tying this to the first lady alone, but anyone in the first family should not hold such a position. Why? Because it makes accountability complex. I'm sure there are many people in the Ministry of Education who would... Uh, who feel that things are not going the right way and they would have very good advice to give, but they're not giving advice to just a minister. They are giving advice almost to a president, mm. someone who is at the same level as the president. They fear if that advice is not taken in good spirit, what the repercussions could be even to their position, even to their job. It's not the same way I could... Uh, address, let's say, Chris Bariomunsi or uh, the Prime Minister uh, Nabanja. It's not the same way I would address if something went wrong. There are many people who simply go mute when something goes wrong in the Ministry of Education. Even currently, people speak in tongues, quite a number of them. The teachers who are raising voices about schools being closed and uh, uh, the suggestions that are being made, the conditions for opening schools, but they cannot express it directly because it's a first lady holding that position. The same would go to the first son holding a public position and how people might not be free uh, to respond to her. One of the outrageous things, in my view, um, that... Um, the conditions that have been set for opening schools in uh, January, which many people are not talking about, not because they are not seeing that it doesn't make sense, but I think partly because of where it's coming from, the office and the office bearer. They've said that teachers have to be first vaccinated before schools are opened. Yes, it would be a good thing to vaccinate all teachers. That would be good. But as a condition, a precondition for opening schools, I don't think it makes sense. Were schools closed because teachers were at risk at, at the schools? Were they closed because teachers are, were the highest spreaders in schools? Even if all teachers are vaccinated and children can still move from home to school and back, they will, the infection, the virus will move between the children, between the students and uh, from the community to school and we are not going to turn all our schools into boarding schools overnight that maybe when teachers are vaccinated you're sure no one is bringing the virus from the community to the schools and back but you hear everyone repeating that as a precondition that makes sense that okay yes teachers are being vaccinated we are going to open even if all teachers are vaccinated it will not remove the reason for which schools were uh, we are open. So I bring that up just as one example to show that there are so many things that are questionable about how the Ministry of Education is being run. But how do you speak about them except if we are to, you are to resort to satire, except if you are to speak in tongues <laughs> again so that you don't get a club hanging over your head for what you have just said. Exactly. Right. So I think that's precisely what I would say about that video. It connects to so many things uh, from uh, uh, the state of parents are uh, being asked to help uh, our students, but even why or how mm -hmm. we get to such a state and mm -hmm. maybe why we are unable to move out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Mitala, your thoughts on that? 
I'm not gonna comment specifically on the on the video, but uh, in a general scheme of things, in a wider scheme of things, something that might be interrelated to that video and what Spire has been saying already is the question of, of affordability of education. You know, I think, uh, you know, in spite of the fact that we are being told that, you know, uh, there is UPE and so on and so forth, of course, that has kind of been, you know, kind of made completely irrelevant in the in, 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 in the current situation where we find ourselves in because obviously kids are not going to school so whether it's uh, universal education or whatever it doesn't kind of make much sense you know right now i think what parents have resorted to those who can is to bring in you know tutors and coaches you know for kind of some kind of tuition and uh, that has got its own challenges because uh, you are we, we you, you you are factoring in here an issue of affordability and i think you have to remember that you know our people lots and lots of our people do not have the means to be spending uh you know forty thousand shillings a hundred thousand shillings per week you know for a child to get that kind of extra help uh in the interim pending the decision to be made as whether children should go back to school or not so what you're finding then is that this is going to be a generational crisis. It's definitely going to be a generational crisis because the, 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 the number of young people and children who are being left behind is, is, is just very unimaginable. You just don't want to think, you don't even want to think about it. I sit on a board of one of the schools here in London, and one of the things that we've been discussing is how the pandemic has affected the progress and learning of children to the to to the to the point to the point that you know schools have had to make very serious adjustments either in their starting and finishing time to be able to accommodate those children who have been left behind you know so to give them that kind of extra support so that the children can be able to catch up now our children in uganda in the Ugandan context children have been away from school for almost two years now those two proper academic years such that if you have a child who was expected to be perhaps going in senior three in March last year, you would have been expecting them to be progressing to senior four, ready to sit there, you know, uh, all level exams and be able to progress on on to progress onwards. And and it's a backlog. It goes back. It's just like standing in a traffic jam because there is no movement backwards. There is no movement upwards. And the crisis that's being created there. It's going to be catastrophic. This is why I classify it as a generational kind of kind, kind of problem. Um, but 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 that issue of affordability is a very serious issue. Factoring in things like uh, lack of access to uh, a proper learning environment, you know, there's no access to the internet in other places. And now, and, and I and I understand our limitations. I don't want to compare ourselves to the situations of Kenya. Or, or Rwanda for that matter, because I understand that in the Rwandan government made, you know, uh, made arrangements to make sure, you know, the, the, the kids in Rwanda, they, they, they are able to go in school by, you know, facilitating access to online learning and so on and so forth. Ours has always been a crisis. Ours has always been a, a, a line of promises that uh, never seem to materialize anywhere, you know. We are promised radios, we are promised TV, TV sites, we are promised this, this, this and that, and nothing just seems to happen. And I mean this that you have millions and millions of young children who are being properly disadvantaged. And to make it worse, as I understand, there are some other schools that are operating, the so-called international schools, they are operating. So you see the gap there that's being created between the haves and the have-nots. And how are you going to be able to kind of, uh, you know, uh, insulate or minimize uh, against, you know, the challenges that will be coming from that? So we, we, we have a very serious problem there. Yeah. Uh, the, the only way, the only way of coming out of those sorts of things, and I've said it here before, is that the people in leadership, people in government have got to be sincere, late, that might be run by people who have the technical know-how to manage those kind of systems. 
if we continue down this path because it is so and so son, because it is so and so sister, because it is so and so husband, without looking at the the, the actual technical ability for somebody to manage a department, then no wonder that uh, we are seeing the crisis that we are seeing already. Thank you so much for that submission. I think it's very important to bring back the, the technocrats into these conversations. Uh, so that they can uh, advise us uh, or advise our leaders uh, without fear or favor. Uh, and I think we, we shouldn't take uh, uh, Dr. Spire's uh, counsel for granted. Uh, I, I think it's very important for Ugandans to start thinking critically about the people who hold offices, accountable offices. Uh, so should uh, a first lady be holding a ministry? Uh, in the same in a country where uh, she's first lady, uh, that's a question that uh, needs to be examined, interrogated, uh, and uh, a discussion uh, brought forth. Uh, should uh, anyone who is affiliated to the first family uh, occupy a ministry or be hired to 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 over, be pro uh, uh, be hired to procure uh, certain services uh, that uh, directly uh, connect with uh, either ministries of uh, Ministry of Health or any other ministries. Uh, is that appropriate? Uh, you see, you see, Henry, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but something that's very interesting just came to my mind when you when you've been saying that. You know, in these places, I've seen, uh, I've seen a, 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 some kind of standard practice. Children of uh, high-profile people. They shun governments. They don't want to be associated with government anywhere, you know? I remember Tony Blair's son. I think Blair wanted his son so much to be involved in some kind of politics or something like that. And the boy wasn't interested in that. He went away, he worked as a, a sporting agent, and he earned an evening as a sporting agent. So I wonder really, where, where does the appetite for children of... Uh, High profile people, but I'm not saying that they shouldn't be they shouldn't be given an opportunity simply because your father is a minister, simply because your father is so and so that you you are automatically disqualified from holding public office. But I think uh, the journey to acceding that public office needs to be you know properly examined to see whether we are following you know the normal rules of uh, of, of equality. You know, because otherwise you, you you are ending up with this situation where somebody is an ambassador because their father is the former foreign minister. Somebody is, uh, is so All and right. so because their father is so and so. It's kind of ridiculous. And I think I wouldn't be proud. Because they and, just, uh, and you can see... The state uh, of Uganda is not, a, is not a private enterprise. It's not a family business. It we is are, not. not. We are almost, uh, I can't remember off my head, are we 62 million people or 42 million people, whatever it is. I'm going and, for the six, I think. And, and, and we have been told, and I think I can also, you know, agree to that, you know, the, 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 the country is not in lack of people who are properly educated and trained to be able to carry on these functions and activities if they were properly supported to do them. You know, why do we you know, put ourselves in that kind of, uh, I don't want to... Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Like, you know, that, uh, that's a good question that I think we, sh we shall ask ourselves uh, in the coming uh, weeks or months. Uh, but we, we should also think about uh, the notion that uh, now uh, two projects have been brought forth uh, as the next president of Uganda. I've seen Project uh, Rabogo and Project Mohozi uh, uh, seemingly uh, advertising themselves as the ultimate, the ultimate uh, successors of their dad and uh, dad-in-law. Uh, but, 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 but I think as we wrap up this conversation, I, I, I'm going to uh, complete by sharing another uh, uh, picture, of, of, of another illustration, actually, uh, from Spire. We need to understand how you go about... Uh, coming up with this kind of illustration. Uh, and, and I think I'm gonna go back to, uh, to, to Mr. Chigundu's question here, as we, we watch mm -hmm. that illustration there. Ha, wha, what goes through your head when you're coming up with such things? 
What goes through my head? Yeah. What goes through your head? <laughs> it's very difficult to explain what goes through one's head because I, I actually don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you are talking about the process. The process. Yeah, yeah you, we are talking about the process, mm. I think. I, I think mm. me wanting to get into your head is trying to understand that process. Mm. Yeah, usually when um, uh, anything happens around the country, I try to keep my ear to the ground. I try to to follow at least some of the key uh, events. And as I'm following, I'm always looking at the humorous angle. How can I make fun of this? How can I draw humor out of this? How can I make a joke out of it? But to be able to make a joke out of something or to make humor out of a thing, you have to understand what appeals to your public, what appeals to your community. So I know the kinds of things that many Ugandans, I wouldn't say all, many Ugandans find funny or would find funny. So I'll play around those things, trying to tag what happens to those things, maybe bar life, how a drinker would look like, for example, in this particular cartoon. But when someone looks at that image, the facial expression and all that, they would somehow, uh, a certain drunkard or someone who loves the bar, I don't, I'm not trying to say one who goes to bars is a drunkard. Anyone they know that loves the bar, their image comes to mind when they're looking at that cartoon. So those are some of the things in general terms that go through my mind. But interestingly, the cartoons that seem to appeal to bigger audiences are often those that that just come to me spontaneously. Maybe I would say by some sort of, uh, uh, what is that called? Some sort of... Uh, intuition. Well, intuition or an epiphany where an idea comes to you just suddenly, you just everything clear right. as if it's already on paper. So they are right. cartoons that just, uh, I would say maybe it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit that brings them to my head directly. I can already envision in this cartoon, this one will be standing here, this one here doing this, and the words will be this. How long would it take me to draw? It usually depends on the complication of the cartoon, whether there are many images there or not. But on average, about... Uh, some 20 minutes, 15 minutes, others can take me even six hours thinking, and usually those are the ones that are not so good. You take a full day thinking about a cartoon, but even when it comes out, it's really not that good. The best are often those that just appear very clearly right from uh, the word go. But there is no clear process that I would say I consider. At times I just read someone's comment on my page, Spire Cartoons, and the comment inspires the cartoon. And mm -hmm. How do I turn this the other way around? But at the same time, as I look at the things that appeal to people mostly, I do not want to use the humor that, that everyone is used to, because mm -hmm. otherwise it lands when it's already stale. You're using the words that people are always circulating, and you're reproducing them in the same way, then it wouldn't be funny. So I always find another angle to eat, Which another way to make it about to begin? Um, funny or stupid. Yeah, but when you do it, you do something for uh, for a period of time. Over time, you get to know what people want, what makes people laugh, uh, what no-go areas. I also have my no-go areas, <laughs> although you might think I'm very brave. There are things I don't draw about. But it's because I burnt my fingers at a certain point. And I also got to know, okay, this one doesn't really concern me. It's mm -hmm. not about taxpayers. We don't fund um, <laughs> we don't fund that group. Mm -hmm. So if they decide to do things the way they do them, no, I'll not drop out that. And but it all comes with time. Okay. I think I think uh, I think for me the most interesting comment there is that you are inspired by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Holy Spirit has really suffered anything we can't explain, we say it's them. Just like our first lady says, ah, it's God that put me here, <laughs> but we know the God that put him put her there. <laughs> 
Like how about this shoes. one? How, how how about this one? How about this one? Um, uh, what's wrong with it? <laughs> what went what what went through your mind when you are when you are uh, illustrating here? Uh, actually, this I, one I, I don't now. know who that person is, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting. It's just an interesting cartoon. I wonder what went through uh, your you, mind when you are quite that. I'm quite sure if you didn't know that person, you wouldn't find it interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> you have an idea. <laughs> A cartoon of yes, an image of someone wearing a big uh, cape. It wouldn't be funny if right. you don't know the person. I, I, I just want I just want to read something here that uh, maybe that yeah. might, uh, might might help to answer that question here. Because I think uh, I think uh, I think I think uh, he has uh, Spire has already spoken about that 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 that, that, that particular issue. I just want to pick up the quote here, uh, where he says that. Okay, it says I can't find, but I think what he was saying is that his cartoons do right. not do, do not require any kind of uh, name uh, comment that uh, yeah. any kind of any kind of narrative because they speak right. to themselves. <laughs> right. Yeah, I but just I to add, I couldn't find that. But uh, I, I saw, I saw, I saw. He explained that he said that uh, his cartoons, when he produced a piece of work. He doesn't need to include the narrative because the cartoon speaks for itself. <laughs> Actually, if you add a narrative, it means you have failed <laughs> in your work <laughs> as a cartoonist. Uh, some people often get back when you try to explain and they say, why didn't you just write it in text? <laughs> yep. But uh, I, I understand that uh, Henry knows what it means. Uh, he just wants to hear it from me. Maybe just one line on that. I had just been blocked by the time I do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah well, welcome to my company. I'm, I'm, I'm in that group of the blocked. I understand uh, we are about 10 million or maybe half the population of Uganda on Twitter. We do we do have a, a Facebook group, so you're welcome to, to do that. <laughs> I had wanted to tweet at some point that if you're a friend of so-and-so or a follower of so-and-so and you have been commenting on his page and you have not been blocked, then you have a problem. I know, right? <laughs> you have to go and visit a doctor or something. <laughs> you have a problem if you haven't been blocked. <laughs> But but, yeah. but but again, isn't that the symptom? Isn't that the symptom of almost what we are talking about here? That you know, you you it's basically it's we, we can we can we can all be here and we, we have views, we have opinions, different backgrounds, different perspectives, mm -hmm. different ideas of how we all want mm -hmm. life to be. But uh, I think mm -hmm. having having the decency to have an exchange with people. And explain to them your view. Put your put your perspective there so that uh, you can defend it. If if if, mm. if if your if your comfort zone is is mm. to run away from criticism, mm. you know. <laughs> uh, what if what if they become president? What will what, happen? What if, to what, if, exactly. what mm. if you assume a position of authority where actually you have the powers to switch off the internet? What will happen? Exactly. <laughs> Or you could just say nothing yeah. because when you say nothing, nothing is going to be responded to. You. Mm. Right? Yeah, but it, it partly goes back to the issue of um, the first family and holding certain positions. Because even on Twitter, although it might not be an official account of government, but still, you're representing the image of the army, you're representing the image of that position that you're holding. Mm -hmm. If your response to criticism is always by blocking critics, uh, then that is the response of the person in that position. Mm -hmm. But you also ask yourself, he has made a number of uh, irresponsible tweets. Many of us have seen them. Mm -hmm. But you ask yourself, if this was not a son of the president, wouldn't some people in UPDF rein him in or somehow try to talk to him? No, no I don't think that's not appropriate. But because he's not just a, a CDF or a that position yeah. he holds, yeah. there are many people who will see it even within government. They get shocked, but they can't do anything about it. They just keep quiet. Ah, no, leave the, son, the first son in case if you comment. There is someone above who is watching whoever is 
uh, trying to annoy, just like at home, you have this last born who is doing silly things. They mm. even come and pinch you, but you can't yeah. do anything because <laughs> the mother is somewhere there watching what you do. <laughs> so you have to act like it didn't hurt all that you you're enjoying it is ah, <laughs> so this is uh, the first son peeing on us but you know it's the first son let him pee actually you respond by chanting mm. ah, our next president he pees on another next president mm. oh we would have sorted that uh, in just one day yes our man why mm. had it been another person i don't think the response should have been uh, could have been the same Charles Onyango Bosode has posted a tweet, uh, which I had the, the, the benefit of looking at just before we came on air. I uh, just want to quickly have a quick look at it. If time allows me to do that. Uh, yes, I've got it here. There we are. Okay. Uh, this is a tweet from Business Personalities. And according to Charles Nyango Bo, he says, if true, this war of words between Uganda's President Museveni, who came to power through a bush war 35 years ago, and Guinea's new co-leaders, has just got very interesting. And he fires a question that will Kampala hold the fire back? Let's watch the space. Interesting times. We might come back to answer that question. Will Kampala <laughs> hold but, uh, the fire? Yeah, but uh, uh, I think... Uh, just to revert, and I know how you're going to wrap up, but just to revert to the subject of, uh, you know, this satirical representation of ideas and opinions, I think uh, Spire would be comforted, and I know that he's comforted because he's got lots of support, you know, from, you know, across the entire nation, if not even beyond, that, uh, you know, satire is more engaging. For, especially for young people, not only young people, but even older people, is more engaging. Uh, people feel much more inclined to, 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 to follow a satirical kind of representation than what would normally happen if they were reading a piece of article. You know, and I, and I think also it's been confirmed that uh, followers of satire tend to be a lot more knowledgeable than, uh, than average people. So it's not all in vain. And I, and I, and I think for me, the, the lesson I take away from that in response to the question uh, you, you, you posed as part of this discussion, Henry, whether, whether it is possible you know, for, 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 for satire to be a tool to disengage you know, a dictatorship uh, from Uganda. I think it's very capable because it, it, satire has got the potential to generate and to mobilize mass engagement to make people critically aware of, of, of those issues that are of real concern you know in the way uh, the country is being governed so it, it is not a wasted tool and i think uh, those who are doing it should continue to pursue it you know in a very manner they are pursuing it it's very effective of course it's not free of risks which uh, they would be very much aware of but i think in the end the the, 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 the the end justifies the means yeah uh here here at university of toronto we do have an entire uh humorous studies department oh uh, really <laughs> so yeah so people who want to engage in humorous studies can actually can actually come here and specialize and graduate mm. with an honors uh in humorous studies uh, which includes satire, of course, uh, political parody and other uh, illustrations. Uh, but uh, as we wrap up this conversation, we, we are almost two hours in. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming, uh, sharing with us. Uh, I do have, we do still have those three books. Uh, I think I've already, I've only received one question from Robert Chigundu. Robert Chigundu, if you are still uh, watching us, you need to to mention which which book uh, which book title is uh, is more uh, more interests interesting to you uh, which one would you like to to take on uh, knowing very well that uncomfortable after is uh, all uh, illustrations or cartoons uh, compiled uh, and then you can read the the quarantine quarantine as well or 
what I saw when I died. All these books, they might be uh, autographed by the author. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, please ask a question or uh, mention it in the comments. Spire, what did you see when you died? Did you wake up happy or...? <laughs> I saw what we have been talking about. <laughs> in other words, he's still in his grave watching. Yes, it was all, all of this. I'll, I'll, all be of in, I'll be interested in that book, and I think I'm going to buy myself a copy tonight. I should have a copy. You should, you should, because much of what we see, we often tell ourselves, no, I must be dreaming. This has not happened. <laughs> so maybe we are dead. I'm just reporting back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so anyway, uh, Mr. Muzukulwamu Swanga, you wrap up and then Spire also wrap up uh, in uh, this conversation. Yeah, um, I, I just want to say that, you know, there, there are benefits to political satire, satire which is a more informed public, uh, ability to mobilize masses to participate in uh, social, current social political issues. And, and, and also, you know, the ability to mock the powers that be, you know. I, I believe, and this is something that I will take to my grave, that uh, if somebody occupies a public office and you are there, it's not your family business, you are in a position of trust, you've been entrusted in that position to carry out certain functions and duties on behalf of the public. And therefore, the public is well within its rights to question and demand for accountability. Therefore, I think for people, public servants, politicians, and so be it, who are errant in the execution of those uh, you know, public duties and responsibilities, I think they duly deserve to be mocked. And I think this is where you know, political satire becomes very relevant. So for me, I, I celebrate people like Spire who have got, uh, who have got the guts to be able to put their heads out there in spite of everything that we know, but they are still able to plow, you know, the dirty waters and get out something that uh, is uh, you know, a contribution to the, you know, the, 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 the narrative that, that, that we have presently in the country. So I think that that for me is, uh, is, my, is my submission. And thank you very much, Spire, for sharing your experiences with us as usual. Please do join us again whenever you do have some chat sometime. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Mitala. Dr. Spire, yeah. please wrap up. Yeah. yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm very happy to be talking about such uh, <coughs> subjects and more the things that affect our country and what we can do about them. Certainly, this is just one of the many things that we can do. Uh, we don't just laugh, we don't just create humor. We should be engaging in other ways uh, possible. With humor, of course, um, um, as I found to use the words of Scott in his 1985 book, which goes by the same title, humor is one of the weapons of the weak. It's mm -hmm. one of the things that weak people, after looking around themselves and asking themselves, what are we left with to fight when other weapons are gone, maybe speech is gone, um, you cannot pick up a gun, you say, okay, let me just use humor. And by ridiculing the powerful, by uh, lampooning them, somehow you demystify their position. You demystify their power. And in so doing, you're attracting other people to say, okay, we can also use our voices to speak back to these people. So power can be contested. Uh, power doesn't mean that one is completely unreachable. So if you cannot... Um, uh, there is, I think it's it, Runyankore uh, saying or something... Uh, someone who, well, it's a bit uh, gross, I will not <laughs> go into it. Yeah, but even when you fail at uh, removing a rock, you might throw a stone at it. Somehow that empowers you that I've been able to hit this rock with a stone. So you're always <laughs> saying, at least I have stoned it. <laughs> yeah, but um, it's just a way of opening up other possibilities of resistance, other possibilities of uh, claiming our space, of claiming our uh, legitimate, uh, legitimate space, of claiming our powers back, of trying to create a, a better society. I just urge whoever sees my cartoons or reads my articles, 
it's not just about laughter, as some few people might think. Let's try to push it beyond. But most importantly, for me, I use that because it's one of the means that I have. But if you have other means, use that. Do not just sit and celebrate a person using another means, yet you have views that you have kept on the side or that you have, um, out of fear, decided not to, uh, to deploy. Use your own means, no matter how small it might seem to be. You never know what kind of impact it can have. When I just started drawing cartoons about 13 years ago, I did not have any followers. I did not have anyone even responding to my cartoons. So it takes time and consistency in trying to uh, speak, in trying to improve yourself, but also trying to show that you have a principle that you're following, you have an agenda, you're not just swayed into different directions. Ultimately, there will be something to harvest. Thank you. I'm very happy and uh, I'll be glad to come back here to talk about something else. The good thing is that I already have sureties here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if, they, if they allow uh, foreign nationals to represent you, what to I call you? Well, as, I, as I came in, I heard people talking about dual citizenship, so <laughs> I'm, not <worried. laughs> I'm not worried so much about that. Uh, you, you, yes. know, you know, you know, you know, record registrars as also how also have a tendency of disappearing at the last minute when they are needed to you know sign the release papers <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're yeah. so tactical you know <laughs> those are the right. things i saw when i died <laughs> 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 yeah so <laughs> this this laughter this laughter uh, explains mm. the, uh, the, 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 the 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 theme of the, the conversation that we have been mm. having today uh having to to laugh uh, at things that uh, uh shouldn't be laughed at uh, but uh, because it seems that's the only tool that we have uh, uh, at the moment uh but I want to thank you spire I want to thank you uh Julius uh for always uh, sparing time uh, to come and discuss, uh, have these uh, important discussions. Uh, Spire uh, talked about using what you have uh, to express, to teach, uh, to engage others, to ensure that uh, we teach each other, uh, but also continue to uh, to talk about the, the, the conversation regarding how to transform our, our country. Our country. So uh, when I call people to come here to join us on this conversation. I think that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to uh, create a culture uh, of having conversations, difficult conversations, hard conversations, uh, but nonetheless informative, educative, uh, and uh, sometimes stimulating. Church uh, 2 causes a podcast season of videos. Now we go out to Lava. State of the Nation, Mr. Chigundu says uh, that he would like uh, to go for the uncomfortable laughter. Not, uh, it's the uncomfortable laughter, not uncomfortable mm -hmm. truth. <laughs> so, uh, I, I guess you'll have to get in touch with Mr. Spire, but you, you'll have to, to, to pay for, for the shipping if he's going to ship it to the, to, to the U.S. Uh, he will definitely autograph the, uh, the, the book uh, uh, and uh, uh, he will send it to you. Uh, let, let, let us get in touch with, with you. Uh, I, will, uh, I will definitely uh, uh, talk to Mr. Spire so that... Uh, uh, he, he can autograph the book and send it to you. I think you'll have to, to share your, your, your address where he's going to send it. Uh, but again, uh, Mr. Uh, Miss Catherine Bate is asking, can I get one? Uh, can, can you get one what? There's only two books remaining. One is called Quarantined. Uh, the last one is uh, what I saw when I died. So, which of the two do you do you, do you want to, to to have? Uh, which of the two do you want to have? 
uncomfortable <laughs> after has been taken, so there's two remaining. Uh, quarantined, mm. uh, and what I saw when I died. So when you decide whichever you want, I uh, will get in touch. Uh, I'll let uh, Spire know which one you want. Uh, I think uh, he has is is showing you the the books remaining. So you have to choose one of those. One of those. Okay. So she says quarantine. You want quarantine? Oh my goodness! I thought you were going to choose. <laughs> what okay, is okay. Going to die. Yeah, but yeah, she she says she wants quarantine. Uh, so oh, yeah, she, he will, he will, he, he will definitely autograph those ones, and I will share uh, your address uh, when you you share it, and uh, uh, he will, he will, he will send it to you after. Uh, you will have to 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 give him uh, the shipping costs. I don't think he's going to he's going to have to. Yeah, we shall negotiate that anyway later on after. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Mweba le nyumweba le dela kumanti mtu gove dela. Mweba le nyugwa to gove dela. This is the state of the nation. Uh, and we are very delighted to serve you. Uh, we hope uh, that you enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. Have a great Sunday. And it is my birthday, by the way. Uh, just oh, as happy a, birthday. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Thank uh, you. It is my birthday. birthday. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, right. This is the state of the nation. Irifa Mwanga. We are deliberate, we are reasonable, we are uncensored. The state of the nation.